So today's topic is my food history. And this is something that I've been wanting to do for some time and I I felt a little guilty about doing it because it feels very selfish because <laughs> it's about me. You should but, be proud of it. Thank you. Oh. Yes. 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 But I thought about it a lot and I thought I think it could be really helpful for other people to understand the journey that I've gone through in growing and in my understanding of nutrition in my relationship to food and hopefully that can inspire you and help you maybe understand what tools are available for learning about that um, nutrition and food in general unfortunately is a topic that is very very confusing and there's a lot of misinformation and there's a lot of money put in mm -hmm. by the food industry to try to mislead us and confuse us. And so it's a, I understand that it's a very, very complex topic. It's hard to know what's true and what's not true. And so by exposing and sharing with you the journey that I've been through and the misconceptions I've had at different points in my life and how I've reached um, nutritional maturity, um, hopefully that can be inspiring and helpful to you as well. So the development of my relationship to food from ignorance, which I feel that when I was a youth, I was ignorant about nutrition. I was never taught in school or by my parents almost anything about nutrition. And so I feel that I really was ignorant to nutritional maturity. And at the end, we're going to define nutritional maturity. but. It basically means really having a good understanding about nutrition and the food that I consume and having it affect the decisions I make in what I choose to eat or not eat. And then the long and winding road we all travel because of all of these misconceptions and fads uh, that there are in the food industry that fat is bad for us and then 10 years later fat is good for us <laughs> and that we shouldn't eat sugar, we should eat uh, all of these sugar supplements and you know chemicals and then they say no no chemicals are worse than sugar <coughs> so you know it's back and forth so that's the topic for today so the questions for insight and this is a something that I really uh, would like all of you to do for yourselves is to ask yourself these five questions and what we're going to do is I've divided my journey into five phases, and we'll see that in just a second. And what I do is I ask myself these questions in each of those phases. And could I answer these questions correctly? And what, you know, what was my understanding? So the first question is, what do I eat? And is it food or not? And is it nutritious or not? So how do I know what I'm eating? The second one is, what don't I eat and why? Because there's a lot of nutrition in the, the plethora of things that are available to us. So if I don't eat fruit, because maybe I grew up never having fruit and so I just never learned to like it and now I think that I don't like it. So if I don't eat fruit, I'm depriving myself of a certain amount of nutrition. So the question is why don't I eat what I don't eat. Or maybe I don't eat um, donuts because I know that it has a lot of toxic chemicals, it's a lot of you know, unnatural fats and excessive sugars. So what don't I eat and why? But it has to be a conscious decision, not just, I don't know. So I think it's good to ask ourselves these things. How much do I eat? So I'll ask myself that five times throughout my history. What, how do I eat? And by how do I eat, it means do I eat alone? Or do I eat in company? Do I sit down to eat? Or do I eat on the go? Do I take time to breathe and maybe prayer, pray and be thankful for the food? Or maybe not. So how do I eat? And then finally, what do I drink? Because the single thing we most need for our health is water. So, but we can drink a wide variety of things, and not everything is healthy. Some things 
are healthier than others. And so the question is, what do I choose to drink? So these are the five questions that are going to accompany us in my journey. So if we just look at the first question, what do I eat? Is it food or not? Is it nutritious or not? I'm just going to quickly give you a glimpse of what I knew when I was young. Say when I was 12 years old, if I asked myself that question, what do you eat? Is it food or not? Is it nutritious or not? And then we'll look at where I am currently so that we see this drastic change. If I asked myself when I was 12, what do you eat? I would probably say, I eat what I am given. I don't choose. My mom makes dinner, she puts it on a plate, I eat it. I choose, I eat what I am given and try to eat mostly what I like. So I recognize that there are some things I like and some things I don't like. Sometimes I am forced to eat things I don't like. So if my mom served liver, which I don't like, <laughs> she would say, well, you have to try it. You don't have to eat it all, but you have to try it. So I was conscious that, the, that there were things I liked and things I didn't like. And sometimes I had to try things I didn't like, even though I didn't like them. But I'm not aware that some things I am given to eat are food and some things are not. I always thought, I always thought if my mom gives me something to eat, I think I assume it's food. I had no idea that my mom gave me some things to eat that weren't food, that were toxic for me. And I, you know, I don't think my mom did it because she was evil. She, she didn't know either. And so, you know, she, she was doing what she thought was best for me. Um, and then I have a very vague understanding that some things are more nutritious than others. I wasn't taught nutrition. I didn't know the pyramid. I probably heard the concept of like meat and potatoes being different things, but I didn't understand that they maybe had different nutrients. I just thought, well, if you eat meat, it's nice to have potatoes with it. So I just thought it complemented the experience. So this is my current one. I eat primarily for health and nourishment. So this transition of growth is a journey that I can divide, divide into five distinct food periods. And it's really interesting, when I sat down to do this analysis, it's so interesting how it could be so different. So between the age of zero and 18, I grew up in Colombia. So I call this the Colombia period. I was mostly influenced by Colombian cuisine. And then between 18 and 20, I started college in California. And so I was eating mostly dorm food, cafeteria food. Uh, in the U.S. and then at the age of 21 I had the fortune of starting working at, I started working at a restaurant that was in line with Alice Waters' philosophy and her philosophy is we should eat organic, local, seasonal and I didn't know any of that but all of a sudden I started tasting this food that was just amazing and that made me curious and transformed very quick, quickly what I was eating and then I moved to Sweden between the age of 25 and 35 and Sweden a, so my first food period was Colombia, and it was between the age of 0 and 18. So the qu first question is, what do I eat? Is it food or not? Is it nutritional or not? And it's very interesting because in this time of my life, I was one of four children, and you know we were middle class. And it's not that we didn't have enough money, but whatever my mom cooked and served on the table was always finished. We were four growing boys. And so she could never prepare, she could never prepare, prepare enough food to fill us up. So I learned to eat very, very fast. And all of my brothers and I are very fast eaters, which is not healthy. You should eat slowly, but at that time, it was a survival instinct. The, the faster I ate, the more nutrition I was going to get as a little boy, and it was going to help me grow. So that's interesting because that definitely affected my relationship to food. I'm a fast eater. I still am a fast eater. I'm fighting to change that, but now I understand why I am a fast eater. Um, so that was the most thing. And then what do I eat? I eat whatever I'm served. What don't I eat and why? The thing I least liked was liver. 
<laughs> and after a while, there were enough of us who didn't like liver that my mom stopped making it. So, so that was good. But I also didn't like strong flavors, like olives, like sun-dried tomatoes, like anchovies. And it's very not normal for children not to like that. Um, their digestive system has not de developed the ability to digest those foods. So it's okay for kids not to like those things. And we, we probably shouldn't feed them those very, very concentrated flavors because they can't quite process them. Also, I didn't like milk products because I was allergic to milk as a little boy. So I was not exposed to milk um, after breastfeeding. I was not exposed to just milk on the bottle because it would, I would get rashes. So I drank you know, water and hot tea and I don't know what else my mom gave me, but not milk. And so as a result, I didn't eat yogurt, I didn't eat cheeses, no dairies. So those are the things I didn't eat. How much did I eat? You know, I was a growing boy, so I, I could eat everything and still not feel hungry. I never had a problem with overeating as a child. I just ate and ate and ate, and I felt like my body could just take it. Um, how did I eat? My three standard meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I ate in company, always. With my family breakfast, with my family dinner, and then lunch at school with my friends. But... I did eat snacks alone. I would, rem I remember, um, you know, my mom would give me some money to spend, and during the break, between classes, I would run to the nurse because the nurse sold brownies, <laughs> <laughs> and so I would go to the nurse and I would buy a brownie, <laughs> and I would, I would quickly eat my brownie between classes and then run off to the. So snacks I ate alone. When I would come home after school. I played basketball when I was in school, so I'd get home and I was really hungry and we had a cupboard that had like potato chips and cheese balls and all of those yummy things. So I'd get home starving and I would grab an apple or a banana and then I'd grab a bag of potato chips and, and so snacks I always ate alone. It felt like that was alone food, whereas meals were in company. And what did I drink? I basically drank anything that was liquid and I was told I could drink when I was thirsty. So if I was thirsty, I had no concept of a glass of milk, a glass of water, a soda. To me, they were all the same. I'm thirsty, just give me one of them, whatever is fastest. So, and I, there was something very interesting, except milk because I didn't like milk. Um, there was something very interesting and that was that my parents, even though they didn't teach us nutrition and my mom maybe didn't have a deep understanding of nutrition, they did choose to not have sodas in our house. So there was something about sodas that my parents subconsciously told me, it's okay to have sodas, but it shouldn't be a daily event. It shouldn't be your everyday habit. So if we went to a friend's party and they had cake and Coke and ice cream, they never said, no, no, don't have it. We could eat whatever, but when I was home, there were never sodas. Coke and Sprite and 7-Up were never available to me at home. And I think that had an impact on me that we'll see later on. And I'm very thankful for that. So what's a typical Colombian diet and what were my thoughts on food at the time? A, Colombia has a tremendous variety of fruits. So I ate lots and lots of fruits. And I'm really, really thankful for that. Colombian cuisine is very high in refined carbohydrates. That means flour and sugar. So lots of pastries, you know, all of the meat pastries that you get, and they're always processed flour. It's just a lot of flour. Bread, you eat bread nonstop. You can have <laughs> pasta and potatoes and bread in the same meal. Three <laughs> carbohydrates, just a lot of carbohydrates and a lot of sugar. So chocolates all the time, you know, you go to grandma's house and how does she show you love? She gives you a hug and then gives you 10 candies. So that's the way my grandmother was and most Colombian grandmothers. Um, I ate mostly at home. Going out was a luxury. We didn't really have the financial means to go out. It would happen on occasion and it always seemed like a luxury. Even if it was fast food, to me that was luxury. So I grew up thinking that fast food was luxurious food just because it was different from what, what we, and going out was a special event, so. Um, my mom cooked with very little salt, very few spices, so it was 
pretty simple foods. Um, you know, meatloaf, potatoes, rice with chicken. Colombian cuisine has very, very little vegetables. Sliced tomato and a little bit of lettuce as decoration. You don't eat the lettuce because it's just decoration. It's not really a vegetable. Um, whereas my mom, because she was American, living in Colombia, I got some more vegetables. So, you know, we ate broccoli at home and Brussels sprouts and green beans, things like that, that I think the average Colombian family maybe doesn't get on a regular basis. Um, you do see carrots and peas in a Colombian meal, but very, very few vegetables. Um, and to me, at the time, anything that was labeled as food, so if someone, something was in the grocery store, I just assumed that's food. If it's in the grocery store, if it's in a store that sells food, to me, I trusted them. I would walk in and think, well, this is food, and this is food, and this is food, and this is food. I had no concept. My second period, I came to the United States. I was going to college. I had uh, room and board on top of that. I had three meals at the cafeteria. And so it was interesting because, you know, I, to me it was just different. So now I had this other food, and it was mostly hamburgers and french fries and lasagna and hot dogs and, you know, stuff that to me was luxurious. This is what we ate when we went out to eat. And then the other thing was that it was unlimited. So I could eat as much as I wanted. And that felt also luxurious. Um, there was a salad bar, I remember, that I would eat often from because I love salads. My mom did, did a huge favor to me without knowing it. And that is she forbade me to eat green salads, like lettuce. It was forbidden. I could not eat it. And there, there was a sense to it. My grandfather's uncle was a doctor, and he knew that some farms would uh, spray their salads with dirty water. And so you didn't really know if that had, salad had come from a healthy farm or not. It was easy to get food poisoning because of that. So she just said, no greens. And we never ate raw greens. The only vegetables I ate as a child were cooked, always. So I had this huge desire to eat salads. And actually, I had a friend who lived on a farm. And sometimes he would invite me on the weekends to his farm. And his mother would make these huge salads. And I would eat mostly salad. <laughs> and this friend's mom would be so impressed. She's like, you know, there's lots of yummy barbecue meat and potatoes and all of this fancy stuff. And I would like serve myself this huge plate of salad. She thought it was really cute. So I get to college and there's a salad bar. So I ate a lot from the salad bar. And at, you know, to me it didn't matter if it was nutritious or not. I just, I liked salad, like I liked hamburgers, like I liked mashed potatoes and lasagna and all of this stuff. So I was very happy that I had all of these new things to eat and that I could eat limitlessly. And they also had desserts. So you could always get soft serve ice cream. They always had cookies. They always had brownies. So I ate pretty poorly those two years without knowing it. You know, I was young and full of energy and running around working, working and going to school, so I had a lot of energy to put out. So I think it was maybe just good that I was getting a lot of calories anyway. But I don't think it was so nutritious, even the salad bar, because it's, salad, it's vegetables that are mass produced, and so they're very low in nutrition. So an organic, head of lettuce and a non-organic head of lettuce, the difference is tremendous. And you can taste it, and it's really, really obvious. At the time, I, I knew nothing about this. I just ate my salads and was happy. How much did I eat? I ate a lot. And I realized that portions got much, much bigger. The plate that I was served in Colombia was like this, and the plate that I was served in the United States was like this. Portions were much bigger, and I actually started having a difficulty with that because I was taught to always finish what you were served. That's just mm -hmm. Colombian culture. You don't throw food away. And so I got here, and there were huge portions, and I felt like I couldn't finish them. 
And so I started having this struggle because then I, I would try to finish them and then I would go home and feel Ugh, like I was stuffed. And so that was an interesting change also that all of a sudden I started feeling the concept of overeating and it didn't feel good. So I ate three meals a day and then I didn't eat snacks. You know, I was a poor student, I had no money, no spare money, so I never ate snacks. Those first few years in college, I never once went out and bought myself a chocolate bar. Not once, and I love chocolate. I just didn't have the money. So I ate at the cafeteria breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And that's it. I never ate between meals just because I couldn't afford it. So that was interesting also. What did I drink? I became conscious. So the first semester, I drank a lot of sodas just because they were available and I wanted to try you know, Mountain Dew. I had never had Mountain Dew. What was that like? And all these other things. And very quickly, I started having this feeling that I couldn't quite understand why, that it wasn't good for me. And so I, and I probably came from the decision my parents made to just not have it at home. And so I felt like this isn't something I want to have on a daily basis. And so I just decided at the age of 20, in my mind, I'm just not going to drink sodas. And I think that was the one of the most important decisions I ever made in my life. And it wasn't like a conscious, well thought out, you know, somebody had told me all of the benefits of not drinking sodas. I just felt, this isn't good for me. I don't want to do this. And I just made that decision, I'm not going to drink sodas. But, and so because I came from a culture with a lot of fruit juices, Colombia, I just started drinking apple juice and orange juice, which were the alternatives. They had milk, but I didn't drink milk, so. And apple juice and orange juice are also filled with sugar, but at the time, it didn't matter. I didn't know, and so I, that's what I drank. So what were my thoughts on food at that time in my life? So I thought, there's limitless amounts of food. That's great. The concept of all you can eat seemed somehow magical to me. <laughs> but it had a negative side, and that was that portions were really big, and sometimes I would overeat, and that didn't feel good. Um, there, were, there was a lot of fast food, because that's mostly what was available at this cafeteria. A lot of hamburgers, a lot of hot dogs, uh, french fries, just a lot of fast food. I'm sure that most of the food that comes into those cafeterias is just you know, pre processed and cut and who knows. The rice might be just normal rice and but but a lot of it I'm sure is just processed. And so I ate a lot of bad food at the time. Um I ate certainly less varied than before. The menus at these cafeterias were very simple, like Monday burgers and fries, optional, you know, uh, baked potato. Tuesday, pizza and pasta. Wednesday, burgers and pizza. Thursday, pasta and hot dogs. <laughs> so it wasn't a lot of variety. I wasn't really eating a lot of variety because I had no choice. You know, that's what was available, so I just ate that. Um, but I did notice after a while, at first this was like, oh, yummy, yummy burgers. You know, this is luxury food. After a while, I started realizing that all of this food tasted very bland to me. Even though it, there was something special about it, it was supposed to be luxury food, it wasn't really so interesting to my palate. And so that, I, I had that sense, I didn't really understand it, but I, I did have this sense of, oh, this food, even though it's yummy and there's lots of it, somehow it's a little bland not so special. And then I did start learning about the food pyramid and I did learn about calorie counting. So I was dating a girl during college, her name was Amy, and she was she took a nutrition class and her mom had problems with obesity and she also struggled with being overweight. So she took this class to get informed and so she started calorie counting and she said, Andres, please help me. You know, I want to limit myself to eating 1,800 calories, and she knew exactly how much a toast was. So she's like, if I have a toast and it's 180 calories, I'm going to write it down. If I want to have another toast, tell me not to have more than one toast mm -hmm. for breakfast. 
And so, sure, I thought, you know, help her out or whatever. And so she put butter on her toast and eat the toast and then get another toast. And I'd say, you, you said you wanted me to tell you. <laughs> She's like, what are you, the food police? And I'm like, sorry, no, have another toast. And so I very quickly decided I'm not going to get involved in anybody else's food choices. All I want to control is my own. Because it is something very personal. And I also got the sense that even though counting calories, I can understand the science of it, I thought there's something flawed about it. But I didn't really understand much. But it was interesting to me to get a, a first insight into nutrition, you know, something that my parents had never taught me anything about, the food groups. And so I understood, okay, there's this pyramid and we're supposed to eat lots of this and less of this and less of this. And okay, potatoes have protein and I mean, meat has protein and potatoes have carbohydrates. I didn't really understand what that all meant, but okay, I started getting a notion, and that was interesting. And then, the second year, the summer after the second year in college, I got this job working at a restaurant for the summer. And the restaurant was called the In Kensington. And I didn't know anything about Alice Waters at the time, but it was kind of a daughter restaurant of Alice Waters. Alice Waters restaurant is very famous called Chez Panisse, and it's maybe the most famous restaurant in the United States. And her, her vision or her, um, what she believes in is that we need to eat clean food. We need to eat food, nothing processed, everything should be homemade, and we should work with organic ingredients, we should work with local ingredients, we should work with seasonal ingredients. And there's been a huge movement. She's really transformed the whole United States in this, like the fact that Whole Foods exists is a result of Alice Waters. That's amazing. She's had tremendous influence over a food industry that for a long time was very, very off course. And she kind of brought this arm of health back into the food industry. And so she's somebody that I, we should all be thankful for. And I had the pleasure, I had the, the magical, that I ended up in a restaurant that was 20 blocks away from her restaurant. And the chef at my restaurant was basically a follower of Alice Waters. So anything that Alice Waters said, the, re the chef at the restaurant I was working did. And so I was basically working, you know, in a restaurant following Alice Waters uh, teachings and that was pretty magical to me and so what started happening was that I felt like the food that I thought was luxury food eating you know fast food and what was at the cafeteria burgers and fries it felt like that was garbage food compared to what I was tasting at this restaurant I mean the menus at these restaurants were incredible I ate wild salmon organic pork ribs, you know, homegrown chicken sausages, harpadel pasta, home-baked breads, ginger roasted vegetables, chocolate mousse, pad thai dumplings, curries, <laughs> duck eggs, you know, things with basil and mint and marjoram and <laughs> wine dashed into some cream sauce. I, I had no concept that food could be so delicious. Steph, we're getting hungry. I was, I was in heaven and I started, I, I, I always liked cooking, but to me it felt like, wow, I could never cook like this. And, but I was always in the kitchen like seeing what the chef was doing and I asking him like, what's in this sauce and how did you make this? And so he taught me, he said, you should get a book and just follow the recipes in that book and it's a great book that I basically worked through in 10 years and did pretty much every single recipe in that book. And so it taught me a lot. But, but what's interesting is that I all of a sudden came across food that was something like nothing I'd ever tasted. Not only was it excellent quality food, very nutritious food, but it was made also in excellence by a chef who knew how to combine ingredients, how to make balanced meals. So what did I eat? 
I ate incredible food, and I didn't really understand why it was so incredible. I just knew that this was like nothing I had ever tasted. And it's quite funny, my mom would call me because she lived in Colombia at the time, and she, she would worry. She'd say, are you eating well? <laughs> and I would say, you can't imagine. <laughs> so I began to open my palate to even things that I had never tried before, and even things that I kind of knew I didn't like. I didn't like olives. And at this restaurant, if there were olives in the dish, I would try it and I would think, wow, this is so delicious. <laughs> Maybe I like olives. So I was exposed to a lot of flavors. Um, so what I didn't eat started diminishing less and less. Like very soon it was just milk and dairy that I didn't eat. And even there, when there were pastas and cream sauce, it was delicious. And so I did eat dairy and milk. Um, how much did I eat? Food was so delicious that I began having trouble stopping myself. And so I started overeating. And how did I eat? I was at a very busy time in my life. I was young, I was going to college, I was working at the restaurant, I was working, you know, so I was always on the go. At the restaurant, we had 15 minute break as a waiter and so you'd eat standing up and you know so it was always on the go and what did I drink it was very interesting to me that at this restaurant people would have this luxurious food and they would accompany it with two things either water or wine and I don't think I had ever tasted wine before that but to me it seemed very strange that people would have this luxurious food with water. In Colombia, I never drank water. It was like what poor people drink. But all of a sudden, I was exposed to the fact that these cultured people eating this fantastic food would choose to have it with water. And that was a very eye-opening experience to me. So I started drinking water, and then at this restaurant, they had fresh squeezed orange juice, which is what I had grown up with. So all of a sudden, concentrates, concentrate orange juice and apple juice just started tasting tremendously sweet to me. And I started drinking water. And I did taste wine. <laughs> so um, I started to, so I started to cook from this book. Once a week, I would make a recipe and I would invite somebody to have my food, good or bad. <laughs> And I started learning not only French technique, which was very interesting to me, but the best thing that this book taught me was ingredients. So I was exposed to asparagus that I had never tasted. I didn't know how to cook it. And so I'd go to the grocery store and I'd buy this thing I'd never had in my life. And I'd bring it home and I'd figure out how to cook it. And then I'd taste it and it was fantastic. So I was exposed to a lot of ingredients and I started to learn about local and organic and fresh ingredients. And so I, I would do a recipe and they asked for peaches and I'd go to the grocery store and there weren't any peaches. And I thought, how can there not be peaches? But I was going to, you know, grocery stores in the Bay Area that were catering to local organic seasonal foods. And so they didn't have peaches because it wasn't in season. So I started getting exposed to that and it seemed strange to me but interesting. And then I moved to Sweden, I got married with a Swedish woman, and I lived in Sweden for 10 years. And that was also very transformative because the Swedish people eat very, very clean. There's not a lot of processed food. Most people eat home-cooked food all the time. And so what did I eat? I ate mostly food, not by choice, because I was in a culture that ate very clean food. It was very clean, very nutritious, and very delicious, because it's real ingredients. If you taste organic broccoli, it's delicious. If you taste mass-produced broccoli, it's not so good. Um, and a lot of sweets. I started, I came to a point in my life, my life where I was economically stable and I had money to spend, and so I would go out in the afternoon, and the Swedish have this tradition called fika, which is basically afternoon tea, where you meet up with your friends and you have a coffee and, and they have delicious sweet things, like cinnamon rolls and all kinds of yummy baked goods. 
So I started eating a lot of baked goods. Probably for, I don't know, a year, a year and a half, I, I had a baked good probably just about every day of the week. Um, to me, it felt like a luxury, and it was something I've always been, had a very sweet tooth. So even though I was re eating really healthy, I was having a lot of sugar and a lot of processed flour. What didn't I eat? I finally got over my not eating milk. In Sweden, in Europe in general, the cheeses are amazing, amazing. The quality of the milk that is available is incredible. And so I just started being exposed to this and thinking, wow, this is delicious, really, really good. And so all of a sudden, what didn't I eat? There was nothing I didn't eat, except I didn't drink sodas. This was a decision I made when I was 20. Um, how much did I eat? The portions were normal in Sweden, but the food was so delicious, I was having trouble overeating. And not on a daily basis, but certainly when I went to a party or some special occasion where they had made some <coughs> extra delicious um, you know, food, and I was like, oh, this is so yummy, I want more. And so I would go and I'd serve myself a second plate, and then on top of that there would be dessert, and I'd go home and feel like, ugh, I ate too much. How did I eat? I ate meals mostly with, with others, and then there was this uh, tea time tradition in Sweden, so I ate this fika with a lot of friends, so I had a lot of... Um, and what did I drink? In Sweden, they drink mostly water. So I, I had already gotten this notion that, wow, some people drink only water, and in Sweden it was reinforced. And I started just drinking only water. That was what, that was my default drink, with meals, between meals. If I was thirsty, water was what I started drinking. What's the typical diet in Sweden? It's very, very healthy, very clean. Um, I became aware of the difference in quality of foods. That's where I first encountered a tomato that tasted like nothing, and a tomato that tasted like magic like sunshine and earth and sweetness and sour and everything together. And I thought, that's really strange that two of the same thing, I'm holding two different tomatoes, and that they can be so, so different. And so I'd go to the grocery store, and I remember the <laughs> single day when this thought came to me. I, I had gone to buy fish. I wanted to ha buy a white fish that was high in fat, because I was going to make a cream sauce and I wanted some tomatoes and I was, I was going to slice tomatoes on top of the fish with uh, green peppercorns and then I wanted some vegetables to go with that. We were going to make rice and so I, my mission was to go get some yummy ingredients to make this delicious meal. And I remember standing in that grocery store, it was a tiny grocery store, just real food, just vegetables, mm. fruits, like that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so. Um, I remember standing there thinking, how do I know which fish to pick? Which is the most delicious fish of all of these that I'm seeing? How do I know which is the most delicious fish without tasting it? If I'm going to pick some asparagus, how do I know of all of these asparagus, which is the most delicious asparagus? And I thought, there has to be an answer. And so at the time, I didn't know it, but I started to search. And so then, I began this pursuit of understanding ingredients. And now, 15 years later, I understand that very deeply. I can go to a, into a supermarket and I know exactly which tomatoes to pick. And it has to do with color, it has to do with feeling them, how much water is in them, with smelling them, with seeing blemishes and understanding how that affects the integrity of the vegetable. So, but I began this search that at the time I didn't know, but I, I asked myself, how do I know what's the best ingredient to buy? I would like to know. And it took many, many years, but eventually I got there. So it began this like search to understand ingredients. And then the last thing that's interesting about Sweden is that I was exposed to people who specifically chose their diet. I came across people who were vegetarians and who were vegans and who didn't eat meat, they only ate fish. 
and people who chose never to drink any alcohol. And that seemed interesting to me. And so I had to question myself, why do I eat what I eat? And is there something I don't want to eat or that I think is better to eat? So having people with, who had specifically chosen their diet started questioning myself. Do I have a specific diet? Do I want to eat in a specific way? And I think that was a very, very educational thing for me to have to search inside. So it was a, it was a very interesting 10 years, and I learned a lot, and I think I ate very well. Eventually, I realized that I shouldn't be eating these baked goods all the time. I've never been overweight. I've always, since I was 21, I've always weighed between 55 and 65 kilos. So, I don't know, 150 and 170 pounds or something like that. Um, but, you know, I've gone up and down five or 10 pounds here and there, and I could feel that I was getting a little chubby around the face, and even though I loved sweets, maybe it wasn't so good for me. Um, and then, my father got sick with cancer, and I decided that I needed to come back to the States and take care of him. And so I moved back from Sweden, and um, it was a very difficult time losing my father, of course, but I think it was very, very important for me because I understood very, very clearly that his cancer even though it had a lot of components, one of the very important components of him dying of cancer was his eating habits. And at the time, I had no knowledge about this, and I couldn't help him in any way. But I remember going to a doctor's appointment with him, and the doctor saying, you know, something you can do to help yourself and help this process of cancer is not eat sugar. And I thought that was interesting. And to me, it was obvious that my dad shouldn't eat any more sugar. Stop the sugar completely. <clears throat> of course, selfishly, because I didn't want to lose my father. But my father walked out of that meeting and said, I'm not going to change my diet. I'm going to continue living the way I've lived all my life. And I had to accept that. So my, do my father died six months later, and it was very difficult. But I think it was a transformative experience for me. Because it made me realize that what we eat is directly tied to our health. 100%. And that wasn't the only reason he got cancer, but it was certainly one of the major factors in my father getting cancer. And so, when I, after he passed away, eventually I moved to Miami, and I began my last period, the fifth period, which I call research, my research period. And I began really, really investigating food and health and nutrition and trying to understand everything I could about how food affects our health. And it's been a wonderful, wonderful eight years of just researching and really making healthy, wise decisions for myself in what I eat. And so now in this last period, called my, my search, what do I eat? I eat food. Almost exclusively cut out anything that isn't food. I don't want to put toxins in my body. I don't want to eat processed foods. And I'm not extremist. If somebody gives me a cookie and it's, I know it's a processed cookie, and I want to join that person, I will eat that, eat it with them. But very, very, very limited amounts. At my house, I basically don't have anything processed. I have fruits. I have vegetables, I have grains, I have beans, I never cook meat at my house. Um, and so I eat food. That's number one. And then mostly greens, mostly vegetables. 
because I know that that's what our body most needs and is most healthy. We also need carbohydrates, so I eat, you know, rice and homemade pasta and potatoes and all of these things, but mostly greens. And then I try to eat a big variety of things. I eat all the fruits I can find, eat all the vegetables I can find, all the roots. I try to, if I find some beans that I've never had before, I'll buy it to take it home and try it. So I try to eat a huge variety, all the nuts, all the seeds I can find, anything that's real food I want to buy. I have this huge case of spices and I love to just try different spices and combine them. Um, so that's what I eat. What don't I eat? I don't eat processed food. And I try to minimize sugar. So I, I now usually don't have sugar during the week at all. And then on Saturday and Sunday, I'll, I'll allow myself to have treats. And I, I think it's a very healthy process. I'm not being an extremist. I'm not totally cutting it out. But my daily routine is very, very healthy. How much do I eat? Finally, in these last two years, I've overcome overeating. And it was a very, very hard struggle, especially on holidays like Thanksgiving and Christmas and you know when there's lots of cookies and lots of yummy food. But I just came to the understanding that it's not worth it. It's not what I want to feel the day after. And I don't need to worry, there's gonna be Thanksgiving again next year. I'll be able to have more pumpkin pie and more <laughs> stuffing next year. I don't have to just stuff myself. I don't want to. What it doesn't you, feel what good to me. your brothers are around now, there might not be enough for Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> I will just eat the small portion that I, I that's available to me. But I, I don't overeat now, and that feels so, so good. And it was really a struggle in my life. Um, not only that, I've started exploring fasting, and so I'm fasting on a pretty regular basis, and it feels really, really good to give my body a break from that regular eating. Um, how do I eat? I'm starting to eat slower. I'm starting to eat smaller meals. I have lighter dinners. I don't want to eat heavy meals close to when I'm going to sleep because it affects my sleep, but I know that. I eat fruits and snacks, uh, fruits and nuts as snacks. So if I'm hungry between a meal, you know, I won't get a cookie or I'll eat a fruit or some nuts. And what do I drink? Almost exclusively water. 99% of what I drink is water. Sometimes I'll have <coughs> wine on a special occasion and my, girl, my girlfriend likes almond milk, so we have almond milk at home. Sometimes I'll have some almond milk if I'm making myself a smoothie or a shake or something. But that's what I eat almost exclusively. Um, so that's been my journey from not knowing anything about nutrition to a place where I feel like I have nutritional maturity. I really understand health and nutrition and my relationship to food how food affects my health. Now, I'd like to define nutritional maturity because I think it's something that we should all strive to get to. So what do I consider nutritional maturity to be? It's that you can identify clearly what is food and what is not food. So if you don't know that, you should learn. You should be able to go into a grocery store and identify very clearly, this is food and this is not food. Um, and not only identify it, but that you use that information to shape your diet. That your daily choices on food should be primarily based on what is nutritious. So eating cookies is yummy. but. Primarily, your choices should be based on what is nutritious for you. That's nutritional maturity. You shouldn't be a picky eater. You should enjoy a wide variety of ingredients. I have a friend of mine who is a vegan, and so you think, oh, you must eat really healthy, but he's a tremendously picky eater. There's tons of stuff he doesn't eat. So what's his average vegan diet? 
Oreos and potato chips. Does that make him healthy? Absolutely not. Just because he's a vegan doesn't mean he eats healthy. He's a picky eater. And so he's, you know, keeping a ton of nutrition from his body. Um, so we shouldn't be picky eaters. We should eat a wide variety of foods if we want nutritional maturity. We need to be aware of what portions are healthy for us and be able to restrain from overeating.